When you hear the term survival horror, I bet your first thought is Resident Evil, and understandably so. Resident Evil's resource management, atmosphere, puzzles, and cinematic camera angles are iconic, but quite a few of those design choices were actually first introduced in 1992's Alone in the Dark by French developer Infogram, a full four years before Resident Evil debuted in 1996. So today, we'll be learning just how formative an influence Alone in the Dark has had on the survival horror genre. Just take a look at this! Legendary Resident Evil director Shinji Mikami revealed in 2014 that Resident Evil was originally conceived as a first-person shooter, but he was unsatisfied with how the game tested. He found the spark of inspiration he needed, however, after playing Alone in the Dark. This game featured arguably the first ever 3D player character model, and you solved puzzles and fought monsters as you tried to escape the haunted Deserto Manor. The environments were represented by 2D backgrounds that you viewed from a fixed third-person camera angle that changed based on where you were in the room. Is this starting to sound familiar? Mikami notes that Resident Evil's development then just became about adapting Resident Evil zombie ideas to Alone in the Dark's formula. So without this game's influence, Resident Evil would have probably just stayed yet another 3D first-person shooter like Doom or Wolfenstein. So how did such an influential but unsung series like Alone in the Dark come to be, and how has it evolved or failed to evolve to keep up with the times? Well, that's the question of the day, and you're in luck, because I have the answer. As we explore Alone in the Dark 1, 2, and 3, The New Nightmare, the 2008 self-titled sequel, and even dabble in the heinous Alone in the Dark Illumination, as well as the two legendarily bad film adaptations. So grab a light and head down with me into the darkness, because friends don't let friends go alone. In order to understand Alone in the Dark's legacy as the grandfather of the survival horror genre, we should explore what came before and what made Alone stand out from the rest. Horror games have existed in some form since at least 1972, beginning with Haunted House for the first in-home gaming console called the Magnavox Odyssey. Haunted House was about a detective evading a ghost to solve a mystery, and you used clue cards and a manual to progress the narrative off-screen and represented the game state on the Haunted House screen overlay as needed. Horror games of note were few and far between, although, as you may remember from my Catacomb series video, 3D Monster Maze in 1981 was technically the first survival horror experience, a game in which you had to evade a bloodthirsty dinosaur just long enough to find the maze's exit. This game actually has much more in common with the recent fad of run-and-hide horror games like Amnesia the Dark Descent, Alien Isolation, and the Outlast series. A Pac-Man-like horror game, also called Haunted House, released in 1982, where you avoided ghosts and monsters to collect pieces of an urn, and on higher difficulties had to light matches to see where to go. Not until 1998's Splatter House, gory side-scrolling beat-em-up, did gaming truly capture the essence of a classic horror movie, albeit the campy B-movie slasher kind. The creepy JRPG Sweet Home by Capcom in 1989 was the next major horror-adjacent game, and was actually the property that Resident Evil started out as a spiritual successor to, but this was really more of a tactical top-down affair than a terrifying one. So when the first Alone in the Dark came along in 1992, it was something truly novel in concept and attention to 3D detail. 3D detail? Frederick Renal, Alone in the Dark's designer, had been making games since childhood, his imagination likely fed by his father's computer repair shop which also rented out videos. And as his skills advanced and he began to work for a new company called Infogram, Renal became more interested in 3D rendering and created a program in which he animated a headless 3D zombie. Around the same time, Infograms was brainstorming a new project called In the Dark, which required careful management of matches as you traverse dark environments. Renal thought his 3D technology would be a great fit for this game, but he had to convince the higher-ups of his value to the team first. Due to the technical limitations of the machines he was using, he decided to demo his 3D models across static 2D backgrounds and enlisted the help of some graphic artists from the company, the most helpful being Yael Barraz, or Barros, Barros. I don't know. The woman who would later become his wife and the mother of his child. She gave him concept art for an attic, and this fit perfectly with the creepy gothic atmosphere that Renal was going for, so he made it the game's first area in the Deserto Manor, a short while after the manor's owner, Jeremy Hartwood, had gone mad and committed suicide. This pitch caused Infogram to greenlight the project, and soon, Renal gathered three programmers together to hash out the dangerous scenarios that the player would face as they attempted to escape the manor. Now, despite the detail of his 3D visuals, Renal wanted a good deal of the game's terror to be abstract and connotative, to ripple in the player's imagination like the pernicious evil that haunted Jeremy Hartwood. Funnily enough, though Renal turned down an offer to make the game an official part of the Cthulhu mythos, he nevertheless peppered the game with countless books, journals, and notes referencing Lovecraftian mainstays like the Old Ones, Alazif, and the Necronomicon. In fact, the main character's name of Edward Carnby is supposedly a reference to John Carnby, who hired a translator for the Necronomicon in Clark Ashton Smith's 1931 story The Return of the Sorcerer, which was the first work to borrow from Lovecraft's mythos. 
I hear their footsteps. Some may understand what I have done. May God forgive me. Farewell, Jeremy. Heartwood. The numerous in-game documents are entertainingly voice acted, and whether they're hokey or believable, they all effectively sell the Deserto's fall to ruin. Adding further literary heritage to the game, Kirby is a mustachioed private detective who resembles Edgar Allan Poe, the inventor of the modern-day detective story. Even early alpha artwork shows that Kirby was initially dark-featured, just like the famous author. The game's setting is also said to have been influenced by Poe's story, The Fall of the House of Usher, which once you enter the greater portion of the manor, you'll start to feel like the house itself is out to get you, just like the story. The Deserto Manor itself is set in Backwoods, Louisiana in 1924. At the game's outset, you'll choose between two playable characters, Edward Carnby or Emily Hartwood. Carnby's been hired to inspect an antique piano for unclear reasons, and he's a classic Bogart-style private dick, whose voiceover makes him sound like, well, a bit of a dick something that Alone 3 in the infamous 2008 sequel picked up on. Devil worship makes me smile, so this is my idea of a paid vacation. Emily Hartwood is the niece of the manor's owner, Jeremy Hartwood. I am convinced that Uncle Jeremy left a note, a letter of some kind, explaining his fateful decision. The gameplay is identical, save for Emily's slightly faster running speed, shorter reach, and different kicking style because she's wearing a skirt. To be honest, though, Emily's motivation is a lot more interesting than Carnby's, but she doesn't have a sweet mustache, so Carnby was my obvious choice. What the fuck is that? So, Carnby arrives by taxi at the manor's gate, clearly being watched from a window high above, a motif that's actually used in the first four Alone in the Dark games. And then Carnby's handsome visage, or visage, since this is a French game, scales the stairs to the attic so he can inspect said piano. He's given a limited amount of time to explore, though, before a fucking murder chicken from hell bursts through the window. Or not. In a turn that would make immersive sims proud, you can actually sequence break the game a little bit by running over to the dresser, clicking enter, and then choosing the push action to cover the window to the attic and prevent the murder chicken from breaking in. Very clever. You're so clever! But woe unto you if you don't have enough imagination or foresight to cover the window, because otherwise you'll have to box this chicken to death or shoot it with the rifle you found in the chest. To achieve this, you'll have to grasp the controls pretty quickly or die miserably. There's no mouse look, so the left and right arrow keys control which direction Carmi is facing, and forward and back keys move relative to the direction he's facing, as opposed to most games where you move on screen relative to the direction of the player. To attack, you must hold down the spacebar and then hold and release the directional keys to swipe up and down or side to side. If using a firearm, hold the up button and release to fire. You'll often take a lot of garbage damage though just trying to get centered on an enemy so that the animation actually connects with them. Calling these tank controls is pretty accurate since this is where they originated, but I prefer flying the ointment controls because of how much flailing you'll do and how much of a bother they are to master. Just the flying the ointment, Hans. The monkey in the wrench. The pain in the ass. But once you deal with this Kentucky Fried Crazy and the zombie whom you can cheese out by covering his trapdoor with the chest, the attic is finally yours to explore. You'll grab a lantern, which would be a great help if you, you know, happen to find yourself alone in the dark. And you'll also uncover a blanket in the cupboard, the aforementioned rifle, a crazed confessional from Jeremy Hartwood in the piano, and in a twist no one could foresee, a book in the bookcase. You don't say! There's a lot to unpack in this first room. It's this game's E1M1, if you will, in terms of being a comprehensive primer of how the game works. Once you've been educated, you'll head downstairs and enter your first in a connected area, which are four rooms separated by, oh look, a collapsing floor. Another, oh, you're so funny feature that Renal and Friends added was death traps. The collapsing floor is the least diabolical, as there's at least cracks in the floor signaling its fragility, but others, like apparitions that kill you if you get too close, or books that kill you upon reading them, have a from software level of disdain for the player's digital lifespan. Forgivingly, though, Alone One offers six save slots to save anywhere and any time so you can try out various approaches to perplexing problems. Unlike the search and destroy type rhythm that games like Doom encourage, here you're incentivized to trial and error your way through new hazards and see if you can spot the logic in them and come up with a solution. The mansion unfolds like a metrovania, requiring you to get to know the manor is attacked to a place that respects your attention to its function and be able to intuitively surmise which items allow you passage through which obstacles. 
you're incentivized to collect everything you find because, you know, you'll take all the help you can get as a vulnerable everyman, but inventory space is limited, so you'll have to be very picky about what you keep on you, and remember where you dropped everything in case you need to come back for it. What makes this triage tricky, though, is that items don't always signpost how useful they may become. Well, gets and keys are obvious enough, but what about the jug of water, the false book, or the aforementioned blanket? Some are necessary to get past death traps so you can beat the game, but others merely give you some creative agency in how you problem solve, reminding me of how in the first Metal Gear Solid, Solid Snake uses cigar smoke to see otherwise invisible lasers. My favorite big brain moment in Alone 1 actually involves a cigar too, coincidentally enough. Turns out there's a study with some nice items in the far corner, but there's a lit cigar smoking up the room from the center table. Carmi can try his luck and attempt to explore quickly and leave before he starts coughing and losing health, or you can be a smart boy and douse the cigar with a jug of water so that you can explore freely. Additionally, while notes and books are often there for simple backstory, they can also double as useful hints for how to slay some of the toughest monsters you'll encounter, and you'll have to read very carefully to find all the pieces of the items that you need. Alone One just has some really great immersive elements that make you feel either really smart or really lucky if you manage to figure them out on your own. And even if you're a basic bitch like me who often scurry to walkthroughs for the obtuse puzzle solutions and who didn't want to drop something and have to retrieve it, I could still appreciate the clever and realistic ways you can interact with the world. So the game's rhythm is exploration and puzzles, punctuated by brief bouts of combat, and it continues in this way until you eventually journey underneath the manor into its cave systems. These are a mostly linear affair, but new horrors await, some corporeal and others that test your patience like a because it's the 90s maze that you must figure out with barely a halo of light from your lantern to see by, and some awkward Kermie Kong platforming sequences. Oh joy. <laughs> There's also quite a bit of presumed imagination on the player's part to figure out item placements in order to beat the game. I won't spoil them here, of course, but there are several I'd have never thought to try, and that's unfortunately one of the legacies of this game's design that persisted even as late as Silent Hill 2, which is regarded by most as a classic. Uh, trash shoot puzzle, anyone? Fuck off! Now, some intuition will help you, but these were the days right before Myst sparked an interest in point-and-click adventures. A lawless time when puzzles were brutally prescriptive and intentionally as hard to understand as possible, either to extend gameplay time and increase the perceived value of the product, or just because gaming was more about making the experience more of a milestone to complete than providing relaxing entertainment accommodations. As much as Alone 1 is the first survival horror game, it's also deeply indebted to the break-your-brain point-and-click adventure games of the 90s, with its 2D backgrounds and pixel hunting, like, you know, where exactly on this bookcase you need to insert an item to open a secret door. So if you take the plunge and try this game for yourself eventually, I'd just advise you to be wary of the archaic controls and the confusing puzzles, first and foremost. But if you're not too good for walkthroughs, Alone One will treat you right with its gothic setup, tense atmosphere, and subtle storytelling. The soundtrack especially contributes to this mood, its instrumentation a sonic tiptoe as cautious as your exploration must be. And when the music ceases, unearthly howls and loud crashes sound in the distance and you'll only be able to guess if something's coming for you. This feature actually reminded me quite a lot of the howls you'll hear around the mansion in Clive Barker's Undying in 2000. So while the grindy puzzle solving and awkward combat aren't always conducive to the drama, if taken on its own terms as a product of its time, when high difficulty wasn't a swear word, you'll likely find this one quite compelling. Worst case scenario, if you're a newbie to these types of games and just need a lot of help to get through it, the game still works as a guided museum tour through one of horror gaming history's formative moments. But enjoy the pacing and the care that went into this game while you can, because the series drastically changed as early as this next entry, in the year of our doom 1993, with Alone in the Dark 2. Now, before we get into the second game proper, we do need to touch on a small promotional prequel level called Jack in the Dark, which released early in the main game's development. It stars Grace Saunders, a young girl who would appear in the main game, and the gist is that she gets locked in this little toy shop of horrors near Christmas time, and possessed toys come after you, and you must solve puzzles to thwart them and escape. You'll have to reference a book of backstories about these special toys that kind of acts as a manual to figure out how to get past them. Some puzzles are clever, and others quite unintuitive, which is coming par for the course with this series. In one puzzle, the titular Jack has to be fed sweets, but he won't react to the gumballs you get out of the machine right next to him, only to a random candy cane you get later on. And then you must use a mirror on him and not use that mirror to distract the vain dolls you need to get past around the corner? What is the logic behind any of this? I couldn't tell you, but oh, and did I mention there's a passed out Santa inside a jail cell in the back of the store? Yeah, it gets weird. Jack in the Dark is cutesy, inscrutable, and a little bit off kilter and serves as a portent of Stranger Things to Come in the main game. 
Now, with that ominous lead-in, you might think Alone 2 would be chock full of puzzles like Jack in the Dark, but the series' core ethic had changed. Frederick Renal had since moved on from the series he had helped create due to creative differences with Infogram, and the reins were handed over to one of his programmers, Franck de Girolami, who was given just over half a year to complete the game. Now, not only was time a factor, but Wolfenstein 3D had exploded in popularity since the first Alone came out, and the hype of the upcoming Doom was poised to sweep up gamers into a frenzy all over again. While Alone 1's writer Hubert Chardot also wrote this game, the tone and the gameplay emphasis are decidedly more campy and action-focused in response to these industry trends. Carnby himself, now disappointingly clean-shaven and built like a Hummer, is now known as a supernatural private eye after solving the Deserto case. His next case comes in the form of a desperate telegram from his mentor Ted Stryker, who's discovered that Grey Saunders has been kidnapped and is being kept in the Hell's Kitchen region by the notorious bootlegger One-Eyed Jack. Ted messages you for help now that he knows where she is, but by the time his telegram reaches you, Ted himself has gone missing, and as Carnby says, he doesn't take kindly to people messing with children or his friends, so Carnby's on the case. Presentation-wise, the game is a different beast than Alone 1. The music is upbeat and really catchy. It's very French, ranging from these jazzy secret agent themes to an almost Baroque camp. Animations are cartoonish and bouncy. Enemies say humorous one-liners like, Hi, guy! And you can even wear a Santa Claus outfit at one point for no discernible reason other than to reference Jack in the Dark. The tone is far wackier and the gameplay has evolved to include high enemy counts and a lot more guns. There's no weight limit in your inventory anymore, and the action menu is streamlined down to just fight or search, with contextual actions like push, throw, or jump becoming available only in specific instances. You're rarely alone, you're never in the dark, and long gone are the overt references to Lovecrafting monsters and menace. In his place, One-Eyed Jack and his thompson wielding gangsters turn out to be, no joke, zombie pirates in disguise. This lends itself to some pretty fun pageantry and set pieces by the game's end, but this is definitely not a suspenseful horror series anymore, at least as far as this game is concerned. You need to look no further for proof of this claim than the opening sequence. Unlike Stryker, who infiltrated Hell's Kitchen like freaking 007 in the opening cinematic, Carnby decides subtlety is for the weak and blows the gates off the mansion with a bomb. Oh, and that crash-in title sequence, give me all the cheese. The explosion predictably alerts the gangster zombie pirates, and they pursue you across a confusing hedge maze for the better part of an hour. Thompson machine guns ablazing. What's really rough about this section is the sheer number of enemies, how easily they can stun lock you, and how finicky the shooting controls are. The fixed camera angles cause depth perception problems and make shots really hard to line up, especially when the hitboxes on walls and doors are actually a lot wider than what's shown on screen and end up blocking shots you swore you had clearance for. You'll have to resort pretty early on to the dominant strat in Alone 2, aggroing enemies and then running back behind a corner or a doorway and gunning them down as they come around. The sprint function is still really inconsistent too, but at least it works more often than it did in Alone 1. All told, this opening sequence is a brutal illustration of what a bad idea it was to chase the Wolfenstein action trend with a control scheme that barely functioned in the first place. But once you've ground through the gangsters and traversed the hedge maze, because, you know, every 90s game has to have at least one, you'll travel through linear underground passageways leading up to One-Eyed Jack's Manor. The puzzle quality here ebbs and flows, you know, some rewarding and others strangely arbitrary, and this really holds true for the rest of the game. I accidentally solved a weird one when I was stuck trying to unlock a door. I accidentally clicked on a newspaper in my inventory, and it disappeared as if it had been used. Confused. I clicked on the door again, but this time with a pipe cleaner, which jostled a key out of the lock and onto the newspaper below, allowing me to slide it back to me and unlock the door. Okay, now that's pretty cool, but I probably wouldn't have guessed that in a million years had there been anything else in my inventory to choose. Now, one puzzle I was tickled pink to solve by myself, though, involved an unassuming paper bag I'd found and a guard sitting on the edge of a precipice. I noted the barrel hanging overhead on a track and the push lever nearby, and I had a eureka moment. I clicked on the bag, assuming Carnby would blow it up and be able to pop it, and the game agreed. I used it to startle the guard, then push the lever, and the barrel swooped down and knock him off the let. Okay, I startled the guard, pushed the lever, and the barrel knocked. Oh my god. It took me like five tries to get the timing right because of how finicky the barrel's hit detection is and how inconsistently the guard walks into the sweet spot, but I finally got him. I actually really like this little gimmicky puzzle a lot. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, but it made you trust the game was playing by some creative and intuitive rules. And the very next instant, I was told that there was a hole in the clock nearby and eagerly clicked on the crank in my inventory, just knowing I'd get this right too, and this would be the right item. Nothing happened. I found that the message actually popped up at the wrong part of the clock and had to reorient myself into that Goldilocks position to try again. 
initially, Alone 2 gives you the impression that it's going to play a little bit more fair and rewards you for playing along. Unfortunately, this impression really only occurs because this section right here is so linear and you basically pick up everything you need and then immediately use it so context isn't lost. In that way, it felt decidedly modern, but it quickly went into adventure game logic once you get into the mansion proper, and then you're tasked with finding lots of small objects or blindly clicking on the farthest corners of rooms in hopes of pulling essential items out of the recesses. Once you get up into the house, the game unfolds like a much brighter, faster paced version of the first game's manner. You go room to room and you must often wade through lots of enemies to get to the puzzle or item aspects of each room. You'll acquire a Thompson machine gun, various handguns, swords, and my favorite, the battle door, which looks a lot like a table tennis battle and smacks like a nun in Catholic school. <laughs> combat's not very good, but at least it's obvious what's expected of you. Puzzles, on the other hand, range from totally fine, like a riddle about a white queen that, you know, clearly relates to the crown in your inventory, to truly bizarre ones like when you need to throw a cheerleader palm into a garden full of snakes so that the clown will chase it and get attacked to death. Alrighty then! And then you're supposed to know that the hole in this very same garden is actually an opening to the chimney of a room you haven't been to yet, and don't know that you're being asked to throw a grenade down to kill one of the mini goons below. What's also strange about this sequence is that the grenade doesn't even clear out the whole room of guys, just one, while a later sequence lets you blow up a whole sleeping quarters full of pirates. Why wouldn't the grenade do the same? And what kind of chimney has a hole in it midway up and shooting smoke into a garden area of all places? The overly prescriptive nature of this game's logic just never really relents and makes it relatively futile to start looking for patterns. This futility is most present in the Grace Saunders portions of the game. At several points, Kermby gets captured, and then you're given control of Grace, just like during Jack in the Dark. She's just a little girl, so you must be stealthy or use makeshift offensive options to defend yourself like Kevin in Home Alone. These sections are conceptually interesting, but fairly annoying to complete. Grace's slowness means you have to judge guard patterns down to the nanosecond to not get auto-detected, and they can even catch you if you've initiated the animation that signals you're traveling between areas, like when you're going down the stairs, which is really cheap in my opinion. And as for the puzzles, here's one frustrating example that tried my patience. I had in my inventory a fuse, a small cannon, a pepper shaker, some matches, and a vase that I just picked up. You're supposed to throw the vase at the door to trick the guy on the other side into coming in and then you ambush him, but it's quite an ask to remember that this guy's even here unless you have elephantine powers of recall to remember which of the many tan doors he's on the other side of, and that's if you even caught a glimpse of him as you snuck through the ship in a previous section. So as he comes to the door, you're supposed to light the cannon and blow blast them, but you can't just light the fuse in your inventory and fire the cannon with it. No, I had to put the pepper in the cannon and then light it with the match. I'm sorry, what cannon runs off pepper? Except maybe a quasi-magical one like an Alice Madness Returns? Don't quirk me out like that infogram. Bruh. Puzzles frequently resist comprehension, and this all compounded to really start taking the wind out of my sails. As charming as its art style, voice acting, and music are, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was having to force myself to keep playing more often than I did in the Lone One. For every cool thing you'll see, like a note that mentions two characters named Booker and DeWitt, that one has to assume influenced Ken Levine when he wrote Bioshock Infinite, to magic portals that let you travel across the house in an instant, to a pretty neat ending set piece that I won't spoil here, the game often distracts you from its atmosphere, with unforgiving combat, its controls can't handle, and punishingly obtuse puzzles. I truly wonder how many folks actually got to the end of this one without any help back in the day. Alone in the Dark only managed one game that felt like true survival horror before design concessions to the popularity of Wolfenstein and Doom came to bear on the franchise. But there's no denying that there's something authentic about Alone 2's commitment to its self-aware tone and tough firefights. The game might even be lauded as brave and what we should expect from sequels if it were released nowadays, what with franchises like Assassin's Creed and Far Cry going years without innovating. So this one's got its rewards, but it's also got its charms, and the soundtrack and art style are just simply far too good to be missed. Plus, this game lets you sword fight zombie gangster pirates, distract clowns with a pom-pom, wear a Santa Claus costume, and even turn on an electric organ that plays Danny Boy while you slay monsters. And that's not something you see every day. Oh, Danny Boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. While I can't say I always loved playing Alone 2, I can definitely say I enjoyed living in it, even as different as it was from the first game. Now, Infogram must have felt they were on a tear because they made an Alone entry for three straight years, the third, of course, being Alone in the Dark 3 in 1994. The story is that a film crew has gone missing in a ghost town called Slaughter Gulch out in the Mojave Desert. The outlaw Jed Stone is responsible, and most importantly, 
Emily Hartwood, the other playable character in Alone 1, was among the missing film crew members. Emily for the case and the tea! Midnight at the water tank! Jed Stone! Jesus Christ! Without giving too much away, Jed Stone's also rumored to be the descendant of two characters that we met in the previous two games, which is a pretty cool way to tie all these games together. The plot structure feels almost like a ripoff of Alone 2 with One-Eyed Jack and Grace, but it's really a very slight backdrop here. Stone himself has almost no presence in the game until the very end, so the Weird West setting has to do all the heavy lifting to keep the player engaged and motivated. And even though Weird West stuff is my jam, I feared that Alone 3 setting would be predictable and generic, very, you know, yeehaw, get along little doggy with all the tired cowboy references you always hear. Ooh, doggy, we got a party now! Now, sure, Kirby curses hell and damnation when he dies and has the occasional try quip, but generally the voice acting and the writing is tolerably restrained. Well, unless we're talking about the natives' voice actors who sound like answering machines. This amulet brought you back from the land of the dead, Wazigun. Danger! Beware of explosions! Keep these reels away from heat and magnesium flashes! What? What? What are you doing? I also have to say I'm a little disappointed about how repetitive and irritating the soundtrack is this go around. There are a couple good grooves, but mostly there's just these plinky little riffs that don't have enough melody or variation to remain listenable over long periods. Unfortunately, Alone in the Dark 3 is also not a looker by today's standards. The engine had really started to show its age in its third year of use, not to mention Doom came out a year before and looked great. So many environments are these monochrome stretches of dark blue or gray stone, gravel, or wood with little unique or attractive detail. You might think that Infogram would use this boring art style to maybe throw the player a bone and make important items stand out all the more from the background, but unfortunately this game is the most egregiously vague of all three in that puzzle solutions range from, oh I guess that makes some sense in hindsight, to what the hell am I even looking at knowing what I might be able to do? Even stranger, Infogram changed the way you search for items or activate them. Sometimes the game let you just run across an item to initiate the take it or leave it menu, but other times you must manually use the search function. This is especially annoying considering how Kirby takes wildly different amounts of time to complete the search animation, with seemingly no regard for what he's searching to even know whether it takes longer to do this type of item or a short amount of time, and so you could be holding the action button down for as long as 5 seconds and just give up because you assume that the game is telling you that you're on the wrong track. Additionally, interactive objects like this skull's horn that opens the trap door requires a pixel perfect activity activation to work. So not only have they scaled back the user friendliness of the very act of searching or picking up items, but the exact sequencing and placement of where you must be to successfully solve puzzles can look like it's not working at all and wrongly make you doubt your approach. Alone 3 also has this really weird habit of providing hints for certain bosses a really long time before you actually fight them so that it's easy to forget them by the time you arrive. I'll throw the game a bone, as, you know, that era of gaming expected you to write stuff down, but why can I hold everything else in my inventory except those hints? Hmm. There are also moments of real fuckery in the boss fights too, where one guy can only be killed by a gold bullet, and so I equip the bullet into my Winchester rifle, and instead of unloading the 10 regular bullets that I had in my inventory, it permanently deleted them to make room for the gold bullet inside the gun. Thanks. Considering how hard it is to imagine what you even might be able to do to solve these puzzles, much less what the game thinks you should do, this user-unfriendly design is just indefensible. Later sections of the game get almost apologetically prolific with hints, but it's too little, too late. One such hint comes in the creative lore-specific sequences I mentioned earlier, something that I actually thought was pretty cool. At one point, you actually die, and a shaman sends your spirit into a cougar, and you're given a limited amount of time to retrieve a magical item and kill two werewolves to resurrect yourself. You know, standard stuff. The werewolves are invulnerable to everything except silver, and you must dip your paw first into a tar barrel that's completely obscured by the camera angles, and then into a barrel of silver shavings that you've probably not seen for about two to three hours of game time and probably won't remember even exists. The game tries to give you some hints after the tar lack silver will kill werewolves, but I didn't remember the barrel at all, and this message didn't even show up the first couple times I tried this sequence. This section is a bit of a stretch to figure out anyway, but I have to commend the wacky creativity on display here, especially how the werewolves die, reverting into zombies and then into cat spirits before disappearing. I mean, the whole game's zombies have inexplicably turned into cats before evaporating, but here they ratchet it up a notch. I am so confused. Another neat little section has you ingesting a solution that shrinks you down to action figure size, much like Alice in Wonderland. I kind of wonder if this is in any way a reference to the Evil Dead 2 scene where Ash is attacked by little versions of himself. Interestingly enough, the 1997 shooter Blood also had its main character Caleb get attacked by little versions of himself, and their black hats and cowboy attire actually remind me a little bit of Kirby's look here. Probably nothing, but certainly a possible influence. 
So I guess the most important question to ask after all this back and forth is, did I enjoy Alone 3? Well, surprisingly, as much shit as I threw Alone 2's way, I still think it's better than 3, making 3 the worst of the original trilogy in my opinion. Alone 1 controls like a brick shithouse, but it has a period authentic art style, a creepy soundscape, cool lore, and a cool ending. Alone 2's action is messy, and its puzzles are pretty hit or miss, but it has a likably campy vibe, even if it departs from the preferable atmosphere of Alone 1. Alone 3 thankfully doesn't push its controls to the limit very often and does some fun things with undead cowboys and shaman magic, but the puzzles feel pretty random and unsatisfying, the setting's not very compelling to look at, and the villain plays almost no role in how the story plays out to the very last admittedly cool boss fight, I meaning you're just kind of wandering around without much motivation the whole time. The series' janky controls and aging 3D engine definitely felt like they'd reached their creative plateau, and Infogram wisely hung up the series' spurs after making them for three straight years. The series wouldn't resurrect like Carmi from his cougar spirit walking until many years later in 2001, and the gaming industry had capitalized on his absence, releasing Resident Evil's 1 through 3, Code Veronica, and Silent Hill in the meantime, which practically obliterated Alone in the Dark from Survival Horror's Lexicon, as those series iterated on its foundational design principles and improved them in many ways. So next, we'll see if the fourth game in the series, The New Nightmare, had what it took to regain the dignity to do a grandfather of the genre. Development was handled by first-timers Darkworks, whose work I've actually played, namely 2004's Cold Fear and 2012's I Am Alive. New Nightmare, released on PS2 only in Europe, it came to nearly every other platform in America save the brand new Xbox. Funnily enough, the Dreamcast version was actually the base version of the game. Now, because this game is essentially a soft reboot, Carmi's now a supernatural private eye living in 2001, not the 1920s, and his greasy hair proves that the most important variable in New Nightmare's development, though, was that Resident Evil had released five years prior in 1996 and had taken the world and the genre by storm. Much like how Crystal Dynamics' Tomb Raider reboot series was inspired by Uncharted, which was inspired by the original Tomb Raiders, so too does New Nightmare ape Resident Evil in a very turnabout-is-fair-play kind of way, which is not a bad thing, but it is a thing to remember as we go. The game starts off with a deliciously cheesy 2000s cutscene. Kirby's best friend Charles Fisk is found dead during his search for three ancient tablets that are said to unlock ancient evil. So Carmby sets out on Halloween night to avenge his friend and find out what happened. He's joined by Professor Elaine Sedrak, who seeks to understand the tablets and thinks Obed Morton, the patriarch of the island, might be her long-lost father. They'll take a plane to Shadow Island together, and like every entertainment property ever, the weather or someone attacking you takes the plane out, you crash land, and Carmby and Elaine are separated safe for their walkie-talkies. Much like the first game, which apparently inspired Resident Evil's multiple playable characters, you can choose to play as Carmby or Elaine, and each has a unique campaign. To aid in your selection, you're given this vital information. Carmi's characteristic is a double-barreled gun, and Aline's is father unknown. So we've got a guy who's compensating for something and a girl with daddy issues. Hmm, tough choice, but I empathize more with Carmi's uh, characteristic. Upon choosing your character, a narrator will grimly deliver the line, alone in the dark, just like Resident Evil does. Now, even if you choose Carmi as I did, don't despair, because by game's end, you'll get your fill of Aline's ill-tempered and badly acted personality via frequent walkie-talkie updates. I nearly got myself killed. I'm really scared. You serious? The opening area heavily recalls Resident Evil's Spencer Mansion, from its abundance of stone statues and fountains and other classical architecture, and the main foyer of the manor. Similar to Lone 1 and 2, you're going room to room, scouring each corner for items and notes to help you get to new areas and solve puzzles. Hernby and Aline are 3D modeled on a high resolution, while the backgrounds remain highly detailed 2D. One interesting little detail is that the flashlight beam lights up the 2D backgrounds very convincingly, a trick that entails them swapping out a lighter tile to replace the darker one as your flashlight passes over it. Player movement is leagues better than the previous games, thankfully, as there's a dedicated sprint and activate button. You'll still need to open your inventory to use keys or puzzle items, and you'll want to reload your guns from here too, as the animation in real time just takes way too long. You're given four save slots, but you can only save your game if you consume a charm of saving, which are drip fed to you until about midway through the game and then you should have more than enough to plan out your saves from. How long will that take? Your primary occupation is puzzle solving, and they're all pretty decently brain teasing here with only a couple being a stretch. Clues are cleverly implemented and come in a wide variety. Some puzzles may require you to look through a telescope to find a secret message sprawled on a distant castle wall, while others want you to remember a birthday or pay attention to a specific date or someone's initials to inform you of what code to enter elsewhere. Unlike previous games, anything you read gets stored in your inventory for later reference, which is a great quality of life improvement and which really makes 
you feel more like a detective. Too bad though they're not voice acted like previous games, but alas. Alas, poor Yorick. Clues require a good bit of reading to re-familiarize yourself with their context, but you can be fairly confident that the necessary info is either in your notes or is waiting for you around a corner nearby. What will become fairly trying, though, is figuring out what keys go to which door and in which order the mansion wants you to go to each area. Each key notes which door it goes to, like, Gird for East. But if you look at your map, which is a welcome new feature to the series, the location of the right door often doesn't match the key's description exactly. Another trying problem is how specifically you must be aligned with certain items in order for the activate button to work. Pushing items is unintuitive, as you must push straight ahead and then hit activate as opposed to trying to activate from a standstill and then pressing forward, like, you know, most games. The game also inelegantly and misleadingly gates your progress so you can't go anywhere too soon, like this attic stairwell that lets you climb the staircase but won't even tell you that the door at the top is locked or inaccessible currently, and only becomes interactable at a certain specific point in the story, but without the game giving you any indication that this direction was the way to go. Nice. This probably occurs because the game is trying to account for two distinct campaigns going through the same areas, but this leads to some real confusion on where to go next, and negatively impacts your resource management during combat. Carnby is now a full-on gunslinger with no melee options. Shooting uses an auto-aim feature that mostly works but can wig out quite a lot if using the late-game weapons. Starting weapons like the pistol and the shotgun also chew through ammo quite quickly as they're outfitted with extra barrels. This can really suck too if you're unsure where to go because if you wander around for too long, enemies that you've killed will respawn, causing you to waste precious ammo just to get back to parity. I actually had to scrap my first playthrough and replay the game's first hour because I'd run way too low on supplies and couldn't make it through. This bad beat occurrence isn't guaranteed or necessarily likely, if you're aware of it and play around it, but the possibility of this happening again loomed pretty large in the back of my mind as I played. Now, before I get into what I really enjoyed about New Nightmare, there was one section that was emblematic of how the game can be kind of a pain to figure out and control. The library is a well-conceived area in theory, making you imagine the place is real and interact with it accordingly, but it also kind of falls apart because it doesn't quite follow its implied rule set. The game's notes tell you via a diagram where four books are that you need to push in order to unlock a door, but the space is huge and the camera changes angles so many times that it's often hard to tell where you are relative to the diagram. The game tries to help you by making the appropriate books glint, but I played this section probably ten times and this clue glint never showed up the same way twice, sometimes appearing, sometimes not. Then a boss interrupts the last part of the puzzle and fighting him ranges from confusing as to when he's vulnerable to tedious as it takes almost all your ammo to kill him to sometimes impossible if he glitches into vulnerability. As much as I'd wish this section had been incredibly satisfying instead of bewildering, fortunately, this is usually the exception to how the game works, and it's rarely totally unfair with how it treats the player, which is quite a step up from the bizarro design from previous games. While a little volatile, The New Nightmare was the first alone game that I played for long stretches of time without having to constantly look stuff up. I was losing myself in the world and, dare I say it, having fun. Puzzles were often intuitive and exciting to figure out for myself, and the game's combat was serviceably diverting, but the story and the sense of place are what really kept me intrigued. The voice acting is, you know, often goofy fun, and the plentiful documents lying around the manor are well written, and provide great anticipation for the next story beat. I want you to tell me what's going on. Reading these tidbits, we learn that Shadow Island was once inhabited by the Native American Abkani tribe who used magic to keep at bay the world of darkness, a dimension of black magic and monsters. The Abkani all but died out and years later the troubled Morton family built a mansion there in the island's seclusion. This family is influenced by business partner Judas Deserto, who shares his name with the first game's mansion, and they start practicing grotesque human experimentation in order to understand and contact the world of darkness. Professor Obed Morton, a clear reference to Lovecraftian cultist Obed Marsh, is a foremost expert on Abkhani language and supposedly Aline's father hints her involvement. The game's story finds Obed and his brother Alan continuing the family's twisted research and attempting to fully open a gateway to the world of darkness. Edward Aline and a suspiciously helpful Abkhani witch doctor named Edenshaw are all that stand between the Mortons and evil flooding the world. And that's really just the setup with some additional context and there's more intrigue and set pieces that I won't spoil here. So while the game's scripting is effectively motivating, the strength of any interactive medium is a sense of place that convinces you that you're there and New Nightmare has us in spades. The fully realized mansion is flush with secret rooms full of magical and technological wonders hidden away. You'll brave foggy moors on the manor grounds, comb its catacombs, dare a laboratory full of macabre experiments fully in the dark, 
while mostly alone, and the end game goes full on H.R. Giger in a fantastic way. The environments are pregnant with history and exotic detail, from Abkhani hieroglyphs to gruesome corpses of monsters too horrible to imagine. It's all great pulpy fun and is the primary reason to play this game. I would also highly recommend playing both campaigns as Aileen's sections have some really brain-busting puzzles and some of the most unique supernatural encounters, while Carnby gets to use more of the crazy weapons the Mortons have crafted to kill the creatures of darkness. So, in short, this is honestly the best the series ever played. Now, let's be honest, New Nightmare's return to form was essentially achieved by copying the refinements that Resident Evil had made to Alone's original formula. The cynical type might assert that it was Resident Evil's world and Alone in the Dark was just living in it, but I must insist that New Nightmare has enough of its own creativity and its puzzles and story beats to feel familiar but fresh to fans of either franchise, especially considering the complex ping-pong match of influence the two had played and that the New Nightmare acted as the return to serve for. Unfortunately, this brief moment of strength for Alone in the Dark would be short-lived, as the series would lie dormant for another seven years before being revived in the wildly uneven 2008 entry. I hope you had good news. Yeah, well, no. Now, since 2003, Infogram had been rebranded as Atari SA, and they gave creative control of the 2008 Alone in the Dark game to their subsidiary, Eden Games, previously known for their work in racing games like Test Drive Unlimited. Lead designer, Herb Sliwa, had actually worked at the company when it was called Infogram for six years before, and expressed his love for the original games in an IGN interview. Coincidentally enough, the same publication that would later give the 2008 game a 3.5 out of 10, so, you know. Ouch, baby. Very ouch. I guess you might say the game has a little something for absolutely no one. <laughs> that is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. Herb notes that the game's inspiration came to him on his first trip to the U.S. where he walked through Central Park at night. He noticed the unsettling contrast between the darkness of the park and the lights that girded its walkways, almost like two worlds sitting parallel to one another. He thought this would make an excellent setting for Alone in the Dark, and brainstormed a pitch to Atari for a new game in the series based on this. So, this game wasn't a cynical reboot to keep the trademark alive by a big corporate honcho. This was a legit fan of the series, with a history in its creator's company, trying to make a passion project. And for the most part, it shows. Unfortunately, it's also a game whose passion wasn't tempered by restraint, so every sweet idea is thrown at the wall, and the execution ingloriously whiffs. Now, the PS3 version adds an additional boss fight and fixes the camera and driving problems that we'll eventually talk about, but uh, unfortunately, your boy doesn't have a PS3. And I tried to get this working on a PC, but the game crashes if asked to display at anything above an 800 by 600 resolution. So the Xbox 360 version that I had was where this review was captured. Fortunately, if that's the word for it, this version encapsulates all the good and bad extremes of the game, so it actually works out better this way. Alone 2008 is the most ridiculous and the most polarizing game in the series to date. One minute I was telling myself, man, this game's getting pretty good. And the next I was screaming that this was the worst game I'd ever played and fantasizing about snapping the disc in half. 2008 has thrill minute set pieces, multiple control schemes for third and first person like a Metal Gear Solid game, but weirdly mediocre driving for a company that's only made racing games. It has manually controlled melee combat, blinking as an actual game mechanic, and so much more. The exhausting amount of control inputs and gameplay types can be overwhelming, but it achieves intermittent bouts of thrilling alchemy when it all comes together. Nice work. How'd you do this? Not sure. The game stars Johnny Depp, I mean, Edward Carnby, who's actually voiced by Max Payne, I'm, I mean James McCaffrey, and this time he's a foul-mouthed cynic caught up in a supernatural doomsday conspiracy similar to his role in New Nightmare. Now, many publications at the time of release called this game a reboot, but in-game notes actually reference Alone 1 and 2's events as canon, so it's really more of a sequel that selectively hears what its predecessors have said. Now, that's hardly the craziest revelation here, though, as the game starts off with a bang. A devilish presence has awakened and literally taken root beneath the Central Park, turning it into a disaster zone ravaged by earthquakes. Carnby himself has recently been exercised with this devil but lost his memory in the process, and so he joins with a helpful woman named Sarah and a Forest Coast version of an old friend named Theo to uncover his past and his connection to how to stop the devil and save the city. The plot is very Da Vinci Code hokum, and the voice acting and dialogue are decidedly B-tier. It's also fun though with some of the most unhinged line deliveries in all of video game history. Now give me my stone! I don't have your stone, and fuck you anyway! I'm the light bringer! I'm the fucking universe! Okay, whatever you say. Now I know 2000 schlock when I see it, and everything from the ragdoll physics to the Unreal Engine 3 sheen that every game back then had, like Batman Arkham Asylum and Saw, shows up here. Hell, even the main enemy types are a 2000 standby. Zombies. 
Uh, excuse me. Humans. <laughs> what are you talking about? Now, most throwback of all, the game is set up like an episodic DVD menu and is split into the eight episodes that each begin with a previously on Alone in the Dark recap. The pause menu brings up rewind and fast forward controls that let you jump around to any desired episode or sequence like you're using a DVD player. Now, the back of the box tells you that this is so anyone can get to the end, but this is a suspiciously self aware feature for a game to include. That's suspicious almost admitting fault out of the gate, and we'll go over soon why this was presciently helpful on their part. Now, the fundamental problem with this game is its overly ambitious control scheme. There are first and third person controls, controls for getting into a car, rummaging around in the glove box and sun visor, but also extra controls for driving when you're hanging from ropes and on it goes. Now, I remember very little about this game when it first released, except one review detail that stuck with me, and that was that there was a button for closing your eyes. Well, they weren't kidding. You blinked to clear your vision if concussed or poisoned, and you could even close your eyes to see ghostly clues later on to solve puzzles. Equally unique control options extend to opening up your inventory to combine items together into weapons and different inputs for using bandages for bad wounds or medical sprays for lesser wounds. So let's shift to Carmi's personal controls. In a strange move, the left thumbstick controls both forward movement and the camera, but it's too tight to Carmi's back and often results in disorientation and lack of depth perception. I only skipped a couple sections in this game because I couldn't keep the flashlight trained on these lethal shadows while also moving forward without jerking too far right or too far to the left and letting the darkness get to me. This is a good example of how overpacked the controls are so that they make mundane tasks unnecessarily difficult. This isn't the only place in the game that fights you, which brings us to the combat. Now, Carmi can defend himself by picking up makeshift weapons like bats, brooms, or pipes lying around the environment, and you'll often have a pistol. But the only way to kill the humans is through fire damage. You use anything else, and you merely knock them down for like a second or two before they get right back up. So that means you must either douse your bullets in flammable liquid to make fire bullets, yeah, I know, right? Light your melee weapons on fire, or explode a bottle of flammable liquid to kill your foes. The right thumbstick is used to swing a weapon once equipped that you'll actually have to wind up and then push forward or side to side to attack in the appropriate direction. It's actually pretty reminiscent of the original game's controls. You want to lock on to an enemy to make up for the glacially slow turning radius, but I often found that the thumbstick controls are so finicky that it was more useful to just sort of hold out the flaming object like a lance and run it into things to catch them on fire, which felt about as uncool as it looked. Weirdly enough, there aren't really enough objects that actually catch fire lying around most of the time. A museum level in particular litters the ground with maces and swords that look cool and fun to use, but they don't kill anything, so they're really of no value. I also found that once I scoured an environment for an actual useful flammable object, I often got it knocked from my hands by the human's tongue attack, and since items only burn for a time, this can mean wasting the item entirely by the time you're able to find it and pick it back up again, and not being able to advance. I even had one zombie guy knock my weapon out of the level entirely. So while fighting face up is hella awkward, the shooting fares a little bit better and it's due the creative and fun ways to firebomb the humans. The shooting controls lightly auto-target small enemies, like the poison crabs or the flying lampreys, but you'll have to free aim to hit humans who shuck and jive way too fast with a slow turn radius. Fortunately, should you have picked up the explosive bottles, you can just throw these and shoot them in midair, and this works on trash mobs, but is also the only way to kill the bosses. Now if you prefer to take them out cowboy style, just your bullets in the flammable liquids and shoot fire bullets like I mentioned before. It makes no sense, but it looks awesome, even if it is weirdly hard to actually hit the glowing weak spots in the human skin to set them ablaze. Another sweet offensive option is combining your lighter with any aerosol cans from your inventory, even your healing sprays, and you can MacGyver a flamethrower from it. That's hot. Speaking of combinations, there's a pretty clever crafting inventory system on display here. Your inventory is represented quite literally as your jacket's interior pocketing, which you open Neo style with five slots on your left for stuff like batteries, tape, and bullets, and four on your right for your health sprays and explosives. While in this menu, you can craft new items by combining items from either side. There are plenty of useless combinations, but several will become mainstays like batteries and flashlights or cloth and alcohol to make Molotov cocktails. There are even some cute ones like making a sticky bomb out of Molotovs and double-sided tape, which is used to solve several puzzles too. And while there are a plethora of crafting options, you have limited space in your jacket and have to make pretty tough decisions about what to keep on your person, which is a welcome callback to the first game. Healing items jockey for position with your offensive options, 
so you'll have to be smart about what to keep with you here as well. They generally work like Resident Evil Spray's healing even Kirby's jacket model, take enough damage though, and the game will start a 7 minute timer in which you'll need to use a bandage or bleed out. As much damage as Kirby's model shows though, there's no real reliable indicator of whether it'll take 1 or 5 hits to actually finish you off, leading to some annoying confusion when you get murked and thought you had more damage to take. Regardless, I'm a really big fan of this inventory system, at least in theory, and it reminds me a lot of the immersive design of Far Cry 2's map that came up into the player in-game view. Crafting has to be done in real time, so if you have to swap something out or make a new item, you'll have to be aware of any danger nearby at the same time. To help with this tension though, the game allows you to bind up to four of your favorite item combos to hotkeys, like an aerosol can and a lighter, pistol and a flashlight, or my favorite, a pistol and explosive bottles. <laughs> So, we've touched on the weird controls, the melee and gun combat, the crafting and inventory system, and the fire system, but there is so much more to this game, for better and for worse. This game has a smorgasbord of different gameplay flavors, from lead shimmying platforming, not unlike an Uncharted or a Tomb Raider, to scripted driving sections where you must escape either flying lampreys or earthquakes. There are multiple cool little mini systems and immersive sim style options that not everyone will think to try. Fire is all that kills enemies, but there's also a couple other ways to manipulate said fire, like stabbing a hole in a car's gas tank, driving that car at something you want to blow up, jumping out last second, and then lighting the gas trail up with your lighter for explosive effect. Stunned enemies can be dragged into fire too to kill them if you're fast enough. Fires will sometimes even need to be put out with an extinguisher which can also act as a battering ram to break down doors or be sprayed into a fire to make it a flamethrower which I'm pretty sure is the opposite of how that works. Cars that you drive around open areas must be hot wired if you don't have the keys inside and you can also rummage through the glow box and the sun visor for items and switch seats. There are also all sorts of little micro decisions to make and the only reason they're not thoroughly thrilling is that they're often too much work to pull off when you could just shoot something with an explosive bottle. Enemies are honestly just too fast, and their attacks either knock everything from your hands or disorient you enough that it's not worth the effort to try and fight the stupid controls for all these admittedly more interesting ways of defending yourself. Aside from these options being too much work for too little reward, the pace of gameplay is often dictated by set pieces which will keep you going at a breakneck pace. These often remind me of the trial and error design of Alone One's death traps. One such sequence is the car chase, which is several minutes long with no checkpoints. The car is slow to change direction or increase speed. There are tons of vehicles unfairly driving right at you instead of towards their safety, and the street crumbles in very unpredictable ways, so your car often gets stuck, making the section a real pain in the crack. Mess up it all, and you'll have to restart. Later on, you'll be tasked with keeping these flying lampreys from carrying your car away. The game says that ramming into things or achieving very high speeds will knock them off, but because your car gets stuck on nearly everything and has almost no momentum accounted for by the physics engine, this almost never works correctly. Crashing into things has inconsistent feedback, often failing to drive away the bats after a huge collision, while small bumps into lampposts or benches send fire debris everywhere. I almost skipped this section too, but I eventually got toughed it out and got through it. Now this level of determination really applies to the whole game, but especially to its weirdo set pieces. Like Carmi's controls, they're just too demanding for how loose and unresponsive the actual inputs are. This is really too bad, as conceptually these sections are pretty creative, and every now and again 2008 actually changed these disparate gameplay sections together in a way that builds momentum and excitement. But too often, the critical mass of elements are just less than the sum of their parts. But as rough as the game proper is, you at least get to enjoy a really good soundtrack that has no business being this good. Despite its full orchestral sound, French composer Oliver de Riviere created the music using completely digital sources, the only live performers recorded being the incredibly talented Mystery of Bulgarian Voices female choir. This choir, also more widely known as Mystère des Voix Bulgares, was created in 1952 as a folk music ensemble group specializing in traditional Bulgarian vocal styles, such as irregular timings, modal scales, diaphonic singing, or parallel harmonies, and dissonant harmonies. It's exuberant yet full of character and history, as if it's seen some things, and I highly encourage you to check out the group's other work too, as it's quite an education in singing that you just won't hear anywhere else. Now, the composer de Riviere is also responsible for a plethora of great soundtracks for other really good AA games, many of which I will definitely be reviewing someday, like Greedfall, Vampire or Vampire, The Council, and Plague Tale. 
No other soundtrack of his has quite popped off like this one has, though, as this one hit the mainstream when it was sampled in Pop Smoke's rap song, Flexin', which currently has over 82 million views on YouTube. Story messaging Congress. Mellow. Now, the song's fucking terrible, but man, does that enter a slap for obvious reasons. Now, most people won't likely know where the sample came from, but hey, that's pretty cool and an unlikely exposure for what is one of the greatest pieces of video game music ever created. Life's grand, ain't it? It's indicative of what a fascinatingly strange project Alone in the Dark 2008 is, as its parts are often very unrefined, yet we keep seeing evidence that the developers took this project very seriously. Like Hervé Silva's passion for the series, the Riviera soundtrack is equally committed and commendable. The incredible score certainly amplifies gameplay, but is predictably most notable during cutscenes which contextualize the gameplay well. I've heard people complain about the story, but I actually enjoyed its shamelessly hokey premise about the devil invading the world through Central Park, and Kirby being some chosen one who's managed to live over a hundred years because of his connection to a magical stone. That was certainly a less elegant and original story than New Nightmare, but it's satisfyingly campy like the Prophecy movies or Schwarzenegger's End of Days. Probably most worrisome is the weird facial capture and the quest to malign delivery from an otherwise talented voice cast. Hell, even Sarah is actually a likable female protagonist who factors into the game's ending pretty heavily. And speaking of the ending, the build-up in the ending itself encapsulates the best and worst things about the game and left me feeling honestly rather empty once I'd finished. The biggest set piece, or series of set pieces, are the two late game sections that require you to burn up these giant roots of the devil's influence around Central Park in order to gain access to the final areas. Now the first set can be skipped over using the pause menu fast forward function, but the second set cannot. So the mostly linear third person action adventure puzzle solving that you've been doing opens up to an Evil Within 2 style hub world full of combat and puzzle encounters around each route, requiring you to scour the park for the necessary supplies to pull each of these off. There's a good mix of objectives here, but there just aren't enough items lying around except in very specific places in the park, and they're often very far away from your actual objectives. There's also next to no signposting to give you any idea where these spots are to restock, and random pockets of hyper-aggressive humans run you ragged while you search for them. The whole setup would be fine, I think, if more resources were allocated either near an objective, or made the exploring more intuitive and consistently rewarding when you did stray out into the weird areas of the park. And overall, these stupid repetitive root sections just really kill the story's momentum gating the inclusion just as the drama was reaching a high point. Now, what's truly a bummer to me is how bad these endings are, especially after making you grind through upwards of at least 3-5 to five hours of game time burning up 20-30 to 30 roots. The ending level is just this one big long environmental puzzle, and then you make your choice of a good or bad ending, both of which are super short and super anticlimactic. Now, a bad ending can ruin a game for me. Alone 2008's endings are just a terrible reward for the absolute slog it took to get there. 2008's clearly unfinished, and I've even heard the development cycle was pretty rough. And while it's a product of its edgy, schlocky time, it's also a faithful love letter to the spirit of the original trilogy, from its exacting puppeteer controls, its inventory management, to its, em to the to its emphasis on intuitive puzzle solutions. But 2008 just can't cobble together more than a couple sequences of smooth gameplay, so its parts remain disparate and satisfying only in small doses. Kermie's movie is just too sluggish, the breakdance fighting zombie shitlords are far too hard to hit and too easy to get hit by, the driving stiff, the floor is shadow lava sections are atrocious to get through and there's just this general pall of sloppiness over the whole thing that spoils its good intentions and its fun ideas like the inventory system and its environmental interactivity, to the spray can flamethrowers to the slow-mo skeet shooting of explosives. That being said, its stew of rotten ingredients still has something tasty about it from time to time, and its episodic structure and emphasis on using flashlights to wear off darkness was likely a pretty heavy influence on Remedy's Alan Wake in 2010. It also foresaw that episodic gaming would likely be a popular trend, but with Netflix and the ensuing Telltale Renaissance just around the corner. Alone 2008 is possibly one of the most interesting games ever made, because you can just see where it could have actually been great and just needed more love. It's far too creative, insane, and sloppy to be completely ignored. Atari must have felt the same way, because they enlisted Eden Game Services one more time despite the 2008's less than stellar reception. 
The new game would be a remake of the original Alone in the Dark, a period piece where Carmi was beset by horrors both eldritch and Lovecraftian, and it would feature the series' classic puzzles and item hunting. It would also emphasize the manipulation of lighting effects, as well as quick time events. The game would use the player models from Alone in the Dark Inferno, the PS3 director's cut of Alone 2008, as can be seen in the pre-production screenshots that look just like Carmi 2008's face, the old Carmi's red hair and mustache. You were supposed to be able to play as Emily Hartwood, too, just as you could before. Unfortunately, by 2011, Atari had suffered multiple financial setbacks, so they had to start shutting down multiple projects, and the Alone remake was one of them. Its fate was sealed, and so was the potential for continuing in the series' formative footsteps. The next mainline restart for the franchise would pop up four years later in 2015, which is its own sordid tale we'll get to soon enough. In the meantime, we would be subjected to not one, but two of the worst movie adaptations of a video game ever made, directed and produced by none other than notorious shithead Yuva Bull. And uh, basically my message is, fuck yourself. Now, the 2008 game was supposed to release with 2005's Alone in the Dark film, but development just took too long to complete, and so they missed each other's release window. Now, it's probably for the best, as the 2005 movie averaged just 1% on Rotten Tomatoes, and isn't much of a companion piece since it instead apes details from the new nightmare, with Carmi tracking down artifacts from the Akani tribe to help save the world from a mad scientist bent on unleashing monsters from an H.R. Geiger-themed world. This movie makes no bones about its alien influences, from the snaky symbiotes that infect to people's bodies, to the monster's black scaly armor, and even going so far as to call them Xenos. <laughs> Little on the nose. Now, this is about all the referential movie pedigree this movie aspires to, but the movie's reputation isn't as bad as you might have heard. Yuva Bull's a moron. Fuck yourself. But he has a budget, and some sense of film language that distracts you from how actually boring most of this movie is instead of just side-splittingly bad, with several notable exceptions. I swear there's a problem. What's super funny about this movie is that while the original script was supposedly very true to the game, with Carmby as just a normal guy doing what he could to stave off supernatural horrors, Bull insisted that there be more gunfights and car chases and monsters, and lectured the scriptwriters to no end about how little they knew about storytelling basics. Now, you need look no further for evidence of his inarguable genius in this compelling manifesto on suspense. <clears throat> we must know a little bit more about all this. Look in signs. The audience knows that the aliens want to destroy. So he audience is afraid. Like what you say about Osama bin Laden. We don't know a lot, but we are afraid because of 11-9. So without any information about the aliens, we all feel nothing. We are all confused. But let's say you never would have showed an alien in sign. It would be a disaster. Nobody would take it serious. You have to really wake up and you have to see me what I am. I'm the only genius in the whole fucking business. Goodbye. I mean, shit, he's right. I was riveted the whole time. What the fuck were those writers thinking? <laughs> All right, so let's get to the real bullshit, because that's what you want to hear about. The market chase between Kirby and this Heisenberg lookalike on roids, who elbow drops Kirby from like 20 feet in the air, is a hoot. Before Kirby puts him on ice, of course. Which is appropriate for someone who looks like Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> Stone Cold Steve Austin. Ice. Steven Dorff, who must be okay with his career sucking as hard as the vampires in Blade, shows up as a hammy but game paranormal FBI type to help Carmby withstand the monsters and Tara Reed's porn star acting skills. Just in the nick of time, as usual. Dorff's starship trooper lackeys spout military cliches and generally just die a lot and practice horrible gun safety to heavy metal tunes. <laughs> fascinatingly dumb. It features this gem of a scene where these troopers come across a dead body whose actor gets up mid-scene right after they yell, let's move. Come on, let's move. Come on, let's move. I guess even a dead soldier's gotta follow orders. That's all thoroughly schlocky and intermittently funny. It mostly just has that barely paying attention type of writing with random plot holes, like the mad scientist going from being deathly afraid of the monsters one minute to literally controlling them the next. Or the city evacuating, even though the end fight occurs completely underground and never reaches the public eye. And then we get that classic B-movie monster ending where a POV shot of the monster resurfacing just after we thought we'd won. Ugh, what a ride. Okay, it's bad, but the effects are actually passable. Even better somehow than the wire stunt, like this security guard who gets mauled from behind and is slowly lowered to the floor into a pool of CGI blood. 
Nice. Now, despite its reputation, I actually found the second Alone in the Dark far dumber. So let's go there now. Yufa Bull doesn't direct this one, but his producer Stench is all over it. Frequent Bull collaborators, or Bullshitters, Michael Roche and Peter Shearer direct, and to their credit, this movie actually looks a lot better than Bull's did, primarily due to the decent color grading versus the very flat lighting from the first movie. Now, Gaston Carmby is an Asian gentleman and is certainly an interesting choice, but it doesn't really go anywhere as, unfortunately, Steve Yun has the charisma of a Lincoln log. His default expression just being a blank stare as he ignores direct questions and looks straight ahead most of the time. Now, adding to the stupid fun, is Bill Mosley from Rob Zombie's House of the Dead trilogy, who shows up to do some of the most low-energy line readings in his weird Will Forte voice. Now, you've been stabbed. As a result, you're going to see things. Now, we need to know exactly what you see. Now, you can either work with us, or you'll end up a dead man. <laughs> The movie opens with ghost hunter types being chased by the ghost of a witch. They have a dagger of hers that's the key to bringing her back to life somehow, and eventually she catches up with them and they somehow think they're going to shoot her to death, you know, like you do with a ghost, right? With guns that clearly aren't firing while sound effects are still going off. It doesn't go well, and eventually the lone survivor, the guy who played Postal Dude in Yuva Bowl's 2007 adaptation, gets contaminated by touching this dagger and ends up getting Carmi contaminated too once he asks Carmi for help with his condition. The only real link this movie has to the game is that those infected by the dagger get big veiny crevices in their skin like the humans in Alone 2008. Now, eventually Carmi is rescued by another group of ghost hunter types, one of which is named Natalie, and she's been marked for death by the witch. Carmi's dagger wound allows them to see visions that act as clues to finding the witch's body so they can destroy it and rid the world for influence. The rest of the movie is just basically one big convoluted chase scene. The editing is often very abrupt or nonsensical, and the dialogue is leagues worse than anything in the last movie. For instance, Natalie changed changes her outfit just to drive over to the occultist Abner for help with Carnby's wound. Now, Abner is played by Lance Henriksen, and even he can't muster the strength to deliver the stilted dialogue, even waxing eloquent about how an unconscious Carnby he's never met or talked to is an idealist. He's an idealist. They're the worst. This is a radioactive solution. It makes you invisible to the other side. It cancels out the aura. What are you talking about? There are so many other little dumb things to point out, so let's get started. Oh, shit! The witch attacks the house where Carmi and his new homies are staying. Carmi's like, She's not here because of me. She wants the dagger. How, how would you know, Carmi? You just woke up, man. Now this guy takes the dagger from Carmi just to tell him it's his responsibility to take care of the dagger, and then probably hands it right back to him. It's your responsibility. Thanks. Thanks for that. Now the witch hits this guy with a shelf, and somehow he ends up with a piece of rebar in his leg. Okay. Horrible gun safety from Natalie. Trust me. Best pickup line ever. And this guy dies for some reason? Not sure what that's about. The movie can't even afford to show fire. It just lights up Carmi's face. <laughs> the next scene, Carmi inexplicably changes clothes himself and knows way too much about info he couldn't possibly know. We need a piece of the witch's heart to reactivate it. And then he's like... But this isn't about just me anymore. Bro, it never was. You know, you're an idealist. This man's just flipping through pages of the cliche handbook and picking one. So Abner's maid or housekeeper or something just kind of shows up midway through. And uh, this is the, like the first major scene that she's in. She's dusting off his pants and goes, Ugh. Such an old man. What? The maid then coats bullets in Nickelodeon slime to shoot witch force field. Oh yeah, get it all in there. Every drop. The gun! It's the bullet! If you find that witch's lab, be careful. She'll have all kinds of traps and other measures. You know, really. Really what? What does it have? What else? Well, the door mechanism gets jammed. Girl goes in the other side, but doesn't bother to jimmy loose the mechanism so they can get in. I'm sorry, is that someone sucking through a straw as a sound effect? Tell me now. Now, Central Park is where they come out of the witch's lab, but the editing back and forth from underground to park is edited like an epileptic seizure, kind of like this movie review. The witch's spirit is reunited with her body and then immediately killed. It's fucking hilarious. After an hour and 18 minutes of slow, plotting, banal story, it's over just like that. Oh, not so fast. There's a twist. Because it was too easy. Abner and Carmi reread their clues from earlier and realize, oh fuck, the cipher we read earlier that said free the witch, not kill the witch. Or were they supposed to kill her, but they freed her? I... I don't fucking know. No cipher could possibly get these two totally different words switched out, but oh snap, it's time for a gloriously lame final showdown in someone's backyard. <laughs> and more wooden acting from Carnby. Say something, I'm up on you. 
then the three amigos shuffle off into the house with the dagger they inexplicably left behind, glinting and beating with the sliver of a witch's heart inside. Because that's how B-grade monster flicks always work. Does anybody remember that old Fox Kids cartoon called The Roswell Conspiracies? Every single episode ended with the creature's hand bursting through the ground or some slithering piece of a monster that managed to escape from the good guys. It was never over. I hate that so much. Now, this movie's technically more visually polished, but is so much dumber than Yuva Bowls. But this movie certainly encouraged more repulsion from me, and thus was far more entertaining to hate watch than a Yuva Bowles movie. Fuck yourself, because that is so fucking absurd. Well... That's the rancid cinematic legacy of Alone in the Dark. Having barely anything to do with the games, and only tangentially touching on their themes and lore, it's safe to say that no one should touch this series again unless they want to resurrect it as faithfully as possible. Now, speaking of reviving an old series without the right motivation, the next and final Alone property on our list today is the 2015 video game subtitled Illumination. Let's just... Okay, testing, testing, one, one, one. Okay, I'll... Atari, the publisher of the 2008 entry as well, just couldn't leave well enough alone in the dark. Alone in the Dark Illumination's mostly negative user score on Steam should help you get the picture. This is not a good or a well-received video game. Worst of all, it put Alone in the Dark back in the ground to stay. Now, while developer Pure FPS released Illumination in 2015, a full seven years after the last game, the mechanics feel like bare-bones cribbing from 7th gen games like Left 4 Dead, Alan Wake, and Resident Evil 6. The game is thus a generic third-person co-op shooter starring Ted Carnby, a Leon Kennedy look-alike packs a lot of guns, and may or may not be Edward Carnby after all in a very poor disguise. You can also play as the witch Sarah Hartwood, the great-granddaughter of Sarah Hartwood, who likes to pop that butt in your face on the character menu, thanks for that, engineer Gabriella Saunders, who's somehow not related to Grace Saunders, and the priest Henry Geiger, who has a cool hat and sweet powers. Oh, that's Henry Giger, isn't it? Like H.R. Giger? Nah, I get it. Reference to New Nightmare's art style. There's no real story in this game, there's just these voice acting text pop-ups rife with these elaborate metaphors like they're outtakes from a Max Payne script. The stillness didn't just hang in the air, it suffused the night with an unearthly combination of silence, darkness, and foreboding. Uh, each play session... Each play session starts with an excruciatingly long load time before you and your co-op teammates are dropped into a large level. Then objective items like wires or batteries randomly generate and are highlighted from afar, and you have to go retrieve them and use them to power up generators and the like to get further into the level. As you search for these little MacGuffins, monsters relentlessly spawn and you'll have to light trash barrels or flip on the inexplicably prevalent light switches to weaken them so you can finish them off with your guns and magic. Your flashlight also works to weaken these enemies too, just like Alan Wake. And that's really all the game is, just stay stage after stage of slightly remixing these elements. Illumination somehow managed to fuck up even this simple recipe though. It's easy to get overwhelmed by the monsters, and the time to kill is wildly inconsistent. Sometimes monsters take a clip to kill, or two shots, and the light mechanic rarely ever weakens them the same way twice, if at all. Oh my actual fucking... <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was that? Monsters make almost no sounds, so they easily sneak up on you, and there's almost no sound effect when they're hitting you so you can die out of nowhere and not know why. Now, the priest and the hunter are the really the only enjoyable characters without significant amounts of time spent grinding the measly four-level campaign for upgrade points. The witch only has a very inaccurate and cheaply animated lightning blast at her disposal, and her mana pool is really shallow. The engineer takes forever to unlock anything other than a pistol, and has some mines that sometimes go off and uh, sometimes don't. Cool abilities, like being able to repair light sources, don't make her much more useful either. The hunter's machine gun and pistol are solid combo, and the priest's buffing powers and powerful dual pistols are fun and effective though, so. The game really has to be played in co-op, too, because of how weak these characters are, and anything above easy will dominate you. Even medium difficulty was crushing with me and a co-op buddy. Shkotchki came in clutch again, and lit $20 on fire to come help me capture footage. And let's just say our place testing session yielded incredible results. We determined that, without a doubt, this is one of the worst video games we have ever come across. I think this is fucking broken. <laughs> uh, I objectively think it's broken. I think you're right. Once we got into game, we tried multiple times to get the coal mine level, which is like the second or third level, to accurately track how many batteries we had found to get the elevator working again. But three tries all ended in the game glitching out and not recognizing the proper amount of batteries we collected, one time even acknowledging that we had completed the objective, but then not turning the elevator on so we could progress. It won't fucking work. Wait, it objective says... complete? Oh my fucking god. <laughs> Problem with saying objective complete is it still says find one battery. 
What the and he gets fuck? Behind you. Another time, we were about 10 to 15 minutes into a lengthy level called Escape, where we have to gas up generators, repair a Hummer, and fuel a boat to get out, and each little piece of equipment we needed, like a replacement car tire or bolt cutters, were hidden throughout the level. Well, we hadn't actually found the bolt cutters yet on one playthrough, but we noticed somehow that the game had auto-populated the bolt cutter model on a gate, and then the game promptly opened the gate for us when we clicked on it on a whim. Weird, but I'll take it. So, we looked around behind this gate to find some more pieces we needed, then Shkotsky got stuck behind a gate that closed behind him, not letting me or him open the gate, and then relocking the previously bolt cut gate that we had come in through in the first place, trapping us in a corner of the level. Shkotsky, this may be the best game I've ever played, what do you think? Yeah? Wait, I can't... What? Can you open this from your side? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Hold on, let me see if there's an opening down here. Did that close? I mean, it, it, it can't be a 1 out of 10 because it actually, you know, like, starts and uh, it plays and you can actually get through one level. But it's like... It's a really bad game. <laughs> yeah, this is much worse than uh, 2008. After two hours of the game fucking us at every turn, we threw in the towel and requested our refunds. Unfortunately, even though the game didn't work worth a shit and I had only played several hours because of how broken the game was and had let me progress anymore, I didn't get my refund. Fortunately though, Shkotsky got his, so all is mostly well. <sighs> to be honest though, we didn't miss much, as seen by this Cthulhu boss fight at the end which should have been awesome, but is instead just shooting at a glitchy inanimate model before the end text pop-up tells you that Alone in the Dark will continue. <laughs> They'll fucking threaten me, Atari. I'll sue your pants off. The game turns a suspenseful and thoughtful adventure horror series into a generic shooter with no sense of suspense, no depth, and tons of bugs and glitches. Well, that's really all I had to say about the wet fart in the wind that is Illumination, the end of Alone in the Dark's contribution to pop culture, and a far cry from its auspicious beginnings. Fuck off, man. Sorry. The only good news is that Embracer Group, more recently known as THQ Nordic, bought the rights to the franchise in 2018, and more recently they bought up Eidos Montreal, Crystal Dynamics, and Square Enix Montreal, so they now own Deus Ex, Thief, and Legacy of Kane, among others. They already revived my beloved Darksiders franchise with two new games in Darksiders Genesis and Darksiders 3, which were faithful continuations of the source material backed up by an actual budget, so their level of care and good taste bodes well for any forthcoming Alone in the Dark projects, so I'm cautiously optimistic. But let's get back to the legacy of the series. It didn't capitalize much on its head start in the genre it created. Its tank controls, environmental puzzles, and taste for Lovecraftian scares can be found in everything from Resident Evil to Silent Hill to Dead Space and hell maybe even in Little Dark Souls with its Metroidvania interconnectedness, high difficulty, and love of instant death traps. But while later Resident Evils outside of RE6 managed to answer the call for more action while still maintaining the series' identity, Alone in the Dark has always seemed less sure of its direction. The first three games run on the same engine and play similarly to one another, but with different modulations of the series core formula. Alone 1 was a slow-paced, solitary trek through Lovecraftian hell. Alone 2 had its moments of dorky brilliance, but its emphasis on action unfairly taxed the game's controls, and its upbeat music and campy Santa Claus costume-wearing tone was quite a departure from the original. Alone 3 split the difference, resuming a more methodical, puzzle-centric gameplay experience with some imaginative and zany supernatural sequences, but failed to include a compelling villain or sense of dread. The new Nightmare took notes on Resident Evil's recent triumphs and managed to provide a fun plot, clever puzzles, decent action, and a real sense of place, claiming my vote for the best entry in the series. Sure had that coming. Alone 2008 is a mess, but one you wish would succeed more often because of its bold mixture of ideas. Now, the less said about the movies and Illumination, the better, but they confirmed that nobody in charge had any real definitive sense of what the series had to offer anymore. This realization caused me to ask myself, what makes Alone in the Dark stand out from its competitors, and, and how should a theoretical sequel from Embracer Group incorporate those characteristics? Resident Evil Evil has accessible fiction and gameplay and a diverse cast, while Silent Hill crafts harrowing journeys through personally themed hells based on the main character's fears and failings. Alone in the Dark has fortunately never gone action horror until Illumination, and I think it's imperative this series would remain about puzzles, resource management, and interesting if understated stories. The other immutable tenants are Carnby's isolation, self-sufficiency, and his everyman status. At the series' outset, he was just a regular guy, inspecting an antique piano, until he was thrust into a nightmare situation and asked to cope the best he could with limited resources and knowledge about 
its enemies through nature. Now, I enjoyed the new Nightmare's prophesied savior story in 2008's similar take with spiritual x-ray vision powers. There's also a part of me that wants him to keep being a normie to avoid making random abilities feel like his impressive qualities and not his resourcefulness and subsequent relatability. Now, it's not to say that Carmby possessing any powers or prophesied destiny is anathema to Carmby being a good character, as I'm also rebuffing Alone 2's indirect assertion that anyone baller enough to survive Deserto must have been fucking John McClane after all, not a mild-mannered, awkwardly moving Poe cosplayer like Carmby was in Alone 1. He'll also stand out more and stay more true to the series' origins and strengths if he just manages to pass through mind-ridden circumstances with the skin of his teeth and not feel bolstered by being the writer's favorite, like a heroine from a young adult dystopian novel. That's both personal preference and the mode the series has been in at its best. So if Carmby's kept mostly on his lonesome and asked to use his ingenuity, it's likely that Embracer Group's choice of developer will be on the right track. So... Funny story. Outside of a couple concluding paragraphs, this was initially the end of the video. Until rumors started circulating that THQ Nordic Showcase on August 12th was going to feature an Alone in the Dark remake in the vein of the recent Resident Evil 2 remake. Lo and behold, these rumors turned out to be true. Are you kidding me? What are the odds this releases while an infinitesimally small YouTuber is making an overly long video on an obscure survival horror series in the 90s? Well, considering that the last three games all released within seven years of each other in 2001, 2008, and 2015, maybe 2022 being the year a new Alone game is announced isn't too crazy. Kind of like how Twin Peaks returned to TV 25 years later, just like Laura Palmer prophesied. So you know what that means. It's time to analyze that trailer and pre-alpha footage. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Okay, so this puppy has been in development since 2019 by Swedish studio Pieces Interactive, who has not made anything like this before, but promisingly, the monsters were designed by comic book artist and frequent Guillermo del Toro collaborator Guy Davis, and the story is written by Mikhail Hedberg, who penned the stories for frictional games to horror classics Soma and Amnesia the Dark Descent. The game's elevator pitch is that it is essentially a remake or reboot of the first game in that it's set in Deserto in Louisiana and lets you play as Carmby or Emily Hartwood. It also appears to have its own original story that mixes and matches elements of the series lore. For instance, Deserto is no longer an old manor, but a home for the mentally fatigued. And I bet money that the redheaded girl singing House of the Rising Sun here is supposed to be Grace Saunders, whom you'll remember from Alone too. There are also some brand new side characters with appropriately Cajun and otherwise Southern accents that seem to pepper the grounds of Deserto, much like the manor servants in Clyde Barker's Undying. I'm generally liking what I'm seeing here because it looks like Pieces Interactive somehow heard me from the future and agreed with my assessment of what the series needed to return to. The action looks tense and methodical, and the enemies in the environments are appropriately gross and creepy. Press releases also indicate a return to environmental puzzles and exploration, hallmarks of the earlier games. Not gonna lie, this looks and sounds a lot like classic Alone in the Dark, folks. Now, I do wish the trailer followed the spirit of Atari's cancelled remake a little more closely, because that one at least recreated the first game set pieces with fun twists and kept Carmby's distinctive red hair and mustache. Carmby looks like that doofus of murdered soul suspect now, and I'm not seeing any recognizable level design or landmarks that recalls the old games. So beyond Deserto's name and location remaining the same and Grace's likely inclusion, it's unclear how much is actually being drawn from the originals. Now, of course, if the game is mostly just brand new content and not just a lot of fan service, I really can't complain too much, especially since the game seems to be getting the spirit of the gameplay and the tone so right. Okay, so I bitched a lot about how the series has been handled so far, but I have to say, the future of Alone in the Dark looks uncharacteristically bright. Welcome to the Madhouse, Detective. Well, that's the long and short, but mostly the long, on the Alone in the Dark series in its many forms. It created the survival horror genre as we know it, though the term survival horror would first be coined in reference to Resident Evil, Alone's successor. Resident Evil learned a lot of lessons from Alone and improved the core action and controls considerably, surpassing it in nearly every way more and more as the sequels piled up and Alone faded into obscurity. And then Silent Hill stepped from the mist of time to elevate the genre's storytelling and atmosphere in ways that Alone could only dream of. So while Alone in the Dark's influence has certainly waned over the years, the new nightmare, itself a Resident Evil clone, would become probably the best entry in the series, and the 2008 game, despite its many faults, certainly didn't hold back trying to live up to the series' legacy, and in many ways, trying to innovate upon it. And while I can't definitively prove a collection, a collection, a connection, 
between Alone 1 and 2 and Clyde Barker's Undying in 2000, there are some striking similarities. This game starred an Irish mystic who journeys to a haunted manor to stop a family curse and must fend off Lovecraftian monsters as he travels over the manor grounds and the surrounding areas, sometimes even traveling to other dimensions via portals. And just like Alone 1, you'll hear the howls of beasts in the distance, and the game also features a subplot about a pirate cove beneath the manor just like Alone 1 and 2. So while Alone's influence is mostly foundational, you'll see a blip here and there in the industry that makes you wonder if the series is nearly as forgotten as it seems to be. The end is very near, I can feel it! So that's the end of today's retrospective on Alone in the Dark's gaming and film careers. I hope you learned some cool new info and enjoyed the walk back through time and give these off and unsung games some love. And I hope you'll try them out for yourself one day too. The first three are on GOG is a bundle for pretty cheap, and the new Nightmare is not very expensive either. They also run really well right out of the box, so to speak. 2008 is quite a trying time, but I still think survival horror purists will get a kick out of it. Do not under any circumstances entertain illumination, and your life will be the better for it. Fortunately though, we weren't left alone for too long, as we now have a shiny new remake, reboot, sequel, prequel thing coming sometime in the near future, and I couldn't be more excited. Thank you so much for watching this preposterously long project. It took me quite a while to make, but I don't regret a single second of it. Until next time, if you're ever feeling alone, I want you to remind yourself. I'm the fucking universe! <laughs>